tonight we have Dr. Vanya Gant, who is trained in both microbiology and infectious diseases. Um, Vanya has a number of positions uh, at University College Hospital London, the Hospital for Tropical Diseases, um, where he's both an uh, infectious diseases physician and um, a clinical director for infection at uh, the Hospital for Tropical Diseases. So I'll hand over to Vanya. Well, thank you very much, Will. I trust you can see the screen now. Uh, just a point of correction, I was the Divisional Clinical Director for the Division of Infection. In fact, I was Clinical Director of Pathology for a while as well. Uh, but uh, his esteemed job has now been taken over by my colleague, Dr. Mike Brown. Uh, and I'd better say that because you might be on the line, but even if you wasn't, I would. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I thought I'd go slightly off piste uh, in terms of what I wanted to show you. Um, what, what I was going to do is, is talk more about things that might be closer to individual people's hearts rather than, uh, you know, the big headline stuff and the government policies, etc. So I'm going to start with where, how and when will you get COVID-19 if you do, or will you get COVID-19? So I, th I thought I'd point you towards an interesting paper, which has yet actually, I think, to emerge after period. And this had to do uh, <clears throat> with uh, people who had COVID who ended up in hospital. And what these people did was have a, look, have a look at the air and use various techniques uh, to um, uh, examine how much virus was in the air. And uh, I can tell you, having published with uh, Professor Brewer and various other people a paper on influenza and air, this is extremely difficult work. And you're going to say N equals three, so what? But actually, I think this was very well done work. And what this shows is that these three patients, uh, as you can see here, at various stages of illness, uh, one was asymptomatic, the other two weren't, um, without a doubt, were able to spread into the atmosphere uh, some virus, as detected by sequence rather than growth, I, I have to add. Uh, but what was rather interesting is that whilst one of them, for example, after nine days had no detectable virus, <clears throat> excuse me, the other two did, and without a doubt, um, it, well, without a doubt in N equals two, it would appear that big viral droplet, big droplets of sputum seem to be rather more full of virus than small ones. Hence why some people think that wearing a bandana is probably just about as good as wearing an FFP3 mask. I think that's an exaggeration, but I think you get the point. I should also state that um, all these slides will be available after my talk, uh, and you can look at the original papers, uh, should you choose to. So these people not only looked at the air, but they also looked at the room, and they looked at the floor and the bedroom, and you can read for yourself and what this basically tells you is that if you've got a patient who's got COVID in a room uh, and then you uh, start looking around for viral sequence within that room, you can actually find an enormous amount of it. And I dare say, you know, many people don't spend too much time in intimate contact with the toilet seat. But that does not mean that during that period of time, they are not capable of putting sequence onto that surface. So this was very, very early, very preliminary data, uh, which originally I was very um, dubious about. I wasn't quite sure whether this was true or not, but subsequent to this original data, there are a lot more studies to confirm what they show. They also looked at um, high touch surfaces and they looked at people who were proven to be COVID-19 positive who'd been ill for less than seven days more than seven days and I need not uh, be more specific than that over this slide the bottom line is that the longer you've had COVID proven COVID the less likely you are 
to leave on any surface or any high touch surface uh, sequence that you can recover by PCR. This was PCR, I should add. And then, of course, what uh, you can do is you can, or what these people did is have a look at all their data. And if you look here at the top right picture, I know it's not very big, but you can see that essentially the, the, the percentage of things around a patient in the early stages of disease that will be covered by sequence is really very considerable. I mean, this is 60% here. Okay, but on that, what you can find is that if you look at the high touch surfaces, you have a considerable uh, variation in the CT values, uh, anywhere between about 17 and 38 or 40, yeah, which means, you know, many, many log orders different in the amount of sequence that is recovered. So I'm not going to tell you about the the uh, the bottom picture because what i'm going to do is to show you on the next slide this picture uh in more detail and i think this was really interesting and at the time i think i'm correct in saying that many governments uh were attempting to isolate people on the basis of symptoms and they said, if, you're, if you've got a cough and a fever, you might have it, but if you don't, you're okay. Uh, but this was probably one of the first to uh, show that someone who was positive but well could contaminate surfaces. And these are the blue, this is the blue asymptomatic patient. And if you look here at day five, they contaminated 60% of their surfaces. And some of them right out to day 17 seemed to contaminate 40 percent of the surfaces they were looking at and these were well people and i think this was overlooked and ignored or not believed until this so this is a really 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 interesting story so this is the story of the theodore roosevelt and uh she was at sea and People got sick and she was ordered to Guam. Now, Brett Crozier, who is this extremely well-decorated gentleman, uh, emailed uh, his superiors, said, if I've got coronavirus on my ship, you have to get all my people off. Uh, essentially, his superior officer said, uh, no, don't panic. Uh, and this is not the right thing to do. You will continue sailing. And what's interesting is I'm talking, you can have a look at what happened to that data. It was a wonderful experiment because this is a closed community, a bit like the Diamond Princess, except on an aircraft carrier, there's far less room per person than on the Diamond Princess. And this outbreak curve says it all. His, his acting, the acting secretary of the Navy, Thomas Modley, uh, saw fit not only to relieve uh, Captain Crozier from his uh, from his brief, but flew out to the Roosevelt, where he formally accused him of having wrong and uh, having made, having been stupid. And the interesting thing here, of course, is that with the CDC's backing, etc., we now have this fantastic outbreak curve. So remember that the ship probably had about. 3,000, 3,500 people on board, and it would appear that somewhere around 30 to 40 percent of them, uh, uh, probably a bit less, 20, 25 percent of them, uh, uh, acquired proven coronavirus. And the thing about this that's so interesting is that almost all of them were asymptomatic. And whilst people were doing very clever studies, uh, I thought this was a really, really important sign of things to come. Around about the same time, uh, Drosten and Holcher's group uh, all studied some work on this, and, and they did Nature, and you can see the reference there. They took a lot of swabs and a lot of specimens from people who were uh, uh, admitted to hospital with COVID-19, 
What you can see here is the percentage of seroconversion at around 13, 14 days, they've all seroconverted. I'm not going to show you the data, but interesting enough, it would appear that IgG comes up before IgM. What this shows you is the, the positive culture, i.e. the ability to, oh, I'm sorry about that, to culture the virus rather than detect uh, sequence. So you can see you can detect sequence up to 13 days, but you can only recover the virus after, uh, up to about eight days. And this also shows you uh, some RNA copy information uh, uh, concerning that. So this paper suggested that, and there's some more information here, that people, even though they were COVID-19 positive and sequence positive, might not continue to breathe out or to excrete or secrete viable virus. And the, the paper goes on to show, oh, again, I'm sorry about that. The paper goes on to show uh, the difference between throat swabs and nasopharyngeal swabs in terms of RNA copies and how, as time goes on, you start getting more and more and more negative. Uh, what they also showed is that, yes, you can find sequence in stool. That is shown in this in bottom left-hand picture. And uh, up here on the right, you can see a probit analysis uh, <clears throat> that essentially shows your likelihood of being positive after 6, 8, 10, 12, and 14 days, together with an RNA copy per mil probability of being able to pick up the virus itself. So there's a lot more in sputum. There might be the same in swabs, and there's not much in stool. So what did that tell us? I think that told us that um, it's probably, it, it all kicks off in the upper respiratory tract, and that is the period of intense viral uh, replication, and of course the period of intense infectiousness, if I can use that word. So <clears throat> they also went on, and these are individual patients. This was really very, very concentrated molecular work, and they looked at sputum, they looked at a nasopharyngeal swab and they looked at stool. The brown arrows here show individual patients seroconverting. As you can see, this may be at eight days, it may be at five days, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea behind this picture and the message here is that the longer you have this, the less likely you are to find viral copies uh, leaving that patient potentially to infect others. So, I've got a little quiz for you, but you can't answer because uh, I can't hear you. So you might know who he is, and you might know who he is. And these two people, of course, and I'm sure a lot of you are going, putting your hands up and saying, yes, I know. These two people, of course, relate to this drug. And the eagle-eyed amongst you will note that, in fact, there's a, there's a little accent on the E. And this is Plaquenil, and we know who he is. This is Didier Raoult, who uh, is a friend and colleague of mine, who in Marseille uh, originally kicked off the whole Plaquenil hydroxychloroquine story. I cut to the chase analysis, and the next slide will show you where you can find this. And here's the interesting data. The meta-analysis just simply looked around the world at all those people who'd got hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin or both. And the red, ar red arrow points to uh, the odds ratio. And as you can see, it is extremely clear data. And that is that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with or without a macrolide is really not good for your cardiac rhythm. And uh, I believe uh, President Trump is still taking it. So, you know, we'll see how that goes. This is what that paper said, and that is the reference. No benefit. Increased hazard for de novo ventricular arrhythmia and death. It is real world evidence, and I think this is the definitive paper. I should add, however, that uh, Didier Raoul 
uh, yesterday said, je ne sais pas si ailleurs l'hydroxychloroquine tue, mais ici elle sauve des vies. So roughly translated, and it says, I don't know about anybody else where hydroxychloroquine kills people, but as far as I'm concerned, ici, dans la France, it saves lives. There's a large randomized controlled trial going on now uh, examining uh, the uh, effect of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin with or without the addition of cheese, saucisson, and red wine, because clearly he seems to have a different opinion from the rest of the world. Uh, I'm very grateful to my colleague Hector Maxwell Scott uh, for uh, lending me these slides uh, because he presented this to our Division of Infection uh, Hospital of Tropical Diseases group at UCLH uh, and his synthesis of this uh, second trial, or third trial that I want to uh, talk to you about is excellent. So this came out last week. Uh, so we know this, five million deaths, uh, five million cases, probably half a million deaths, if not more. You know these, da these data. Remdesivir was in fact a drug that didn't really work for hepatitis C and was made by Gilead and has, let's say, enjoyed an extraordinary revival. This is the context. Two papers of using this agent in uh, uh, COVID-19. The study design was an adaptive study design and, the, and adaptive study designs are really very, very interesting actually. And the idea was to see whether remdesivir might be effective. So this was a phase three randomized double-blinded RCT. And as you can imagine, the inclusion criteria were what you would you would expect the exclusion criteria were a bit tough actually so anybody with bad kidneys couldn't do it and anybody whose liver was upset by whatever all COVID-19 couldn't do it and the other thing to note is that there were 60 trial sites with a very heavy bias towards the United States that's what they got remdesivir or matched placebo and uh, any other possible COVID drugs were excluded. Just a point about this, because this is highly irrelevant. There are various ways of measuring if you want COVID illness. And you, as you can see, it goes from one to six or one to eight, depending on you know, where you are in the world. And one means you're okay, two means you're not that well, three means you're certainly not well, you need to be in a hospital for oxygen, and, and you can see how this goes all the way down to ECMO and then death. So one is good and six or eight is bad. So that was a subgroup analysis. Uh, and the study results were on essentially uh, over a thousand patients. Uh, and you can read the paper at leisure. Uh, they were well matched, but Please note, this is really, really important, that it would appear that uh, there was a higher proportion of people with an ordinal scale of seven in the placebo group, i.e., and you can see this, these data here, I don't really have the time to go into, dig into the detail here, that essentially <clears throat> the placebo group had more people who were really, really, really sick. So the primary outcome, yippee, it looks quite good in that it seems to be significant at that level. And if you dig into it, what you find is that it would appear that the best effect was in people with group five, i.e. they were ill enough to be in hospital and they required oxygen. Here are some curves. Uh, and I'll give you a few seconds just to see that. As you can see, the blue guy seems to be better than the brown guy. This is split according to not receiving oxygen versus receiving oxygen. And the top right shows that the, uh, the blue line seems to be pulling out from the brown one. And it, if you can see here, if you look at ventilated patients or ECMO patients, or patients requiring a lot of oxygen, then these differences tend to fade away. 
But this is the interesting, this is the interesting slide, as uh, Hector pointed out when he presented these data. It appears that remdesivir works just as well in people whose symptoms have been less than 10 days in duration, as opposed to people whose symptoms have been present for more than 10 days. So hold, hold that thought. So here are odds of improvement. There was a lot of statistics. That's the, that's the mortality. The one thing that the study did show is that remdesivir does not poison people, uh, unlike the rest of the world apart from France for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. The authors concluded that what you can read in this slide, results in trial suggest a 10-day course of remdesivir, et cetera, re-evaluation. And then there were limitations, and I really don't have the time to go through those, but I come back to this. The placebo arm had a higher proportion of really sick people in it. And lo and behold, the MHRA have said, yes, you can use remdesivir. Uh, I have to say my personal jury is out. So we're pathologists here. So if remdesivir is an antiviral, then surely the drug halts works by halting direct viral damage. Here's a bit of pathology, and, I, and you can see that uh, this lung histology in patients who died from COVID shows really not too much cell infiltrate, massive amounts of destruction, a mononuclear, a mononuclear cell infiltrate, and some fibrinoid necrosis, and we all know about the coagulation. This relates to complement deposition. This is C4D in immunohistochemistry. And essentially, I'd just like to remind those members of the college about horror autotoxicus. And this is what Paul Ehrlich talked about. And he said, essentially, is it that the body itself is destroying itself? And is this an immune phenomenon? Very, very briefly, if you look at these differential gene expression plots in a paper that was published in Cell last week, uh, you can see these are volcano plots. And what you can see on the right-hand side, on this side, is that all these genes are associated with inflammation and cytokine chemokine release. But there is no interferon canonical group one or group three induction at all. And if you look in their blood, you can see the IL-6 goes mad. We know that. But if you look at these CCLA, CXCs, cytokines, so this really does demonstrate this is, the, these are patients and this is their, their, their blood results. This does show that this virus not only seems to switch off uh, canonical interferon responses, both group one and group three, but also does really terrible things to, uh, to those chemokines whose business it is to create massive inflammation. But this is not neutrophils, this is monocytes. So just to finish, is there a silver lining to the cloud? A byproduct of the hydroxychloroquine work is this paper that came out last week that showed that even though hydroxychloroquine and azithro didn't work, they showed a specific difference in outcome in those people who receive zinc sulfate. And if you look at the numbers here, they are far bigger and far more relevant and tight and tough than the remdesivir work. Because of course, zinc works in a whole bunch of ways. On the left-hand side, you can see that we now know these are two viruses. Look at sars one cov the more zinc you put in tissue culture, the less that virus can actually replicate. And on the right, and I've given you the reference, you can read far more about the reasons why intracellular zinc uh, is really important for antiviral immunity. So my conclusions are, it ain't SARS, it ain't MERS. This virus gets in just about every cell in the immune system. We don't really know how many people are infected or have been infected in the UK. And we certainly don't know why some people die and some people don't. Some 106 year old people seem to be fine with it. Post-infection immunity, the case is not proven. Ehrlich, my personal view is he was right. And perhaps I think it's the answer. And on that note, I'll stop. And I'm sorry, I've gone over time. 
Uh, Banya, thanks very much. Thanks for taking us through uh, the illness um, and some of the clinical trial data. Um, so I've had a few questions, but please uh, keep on typing uh, as I'm speaking. Um, and I think you've, you've answered this in a way. Um, so the very first question was relating to why do patients get ill 10 days um, after they, they get seriously ill about 10 days after they present, um, when the data you showed was that at that time, they don't seem to be uh, having the virus. Well, how long you got? <laughs> Essentially, it's an excellent question. I think uh, this was also seen in SARS-1. You, you, you get an initial feverish phase or no, no symptoms at all. And then it, it's, in the old days, you'd probably call it delayed hypersensitivity. I think something happens, uh, and the evidence is around day four, day five, day six, where you start to switch into uh, a sort of, or not a cytokine storm mode. I think what we're looking at in this condition is, is some really subtle um, switching between innate and acquired immunity. And I suspect that what we'll find as time goes on is that it's innate immunity that actually controls this virus. It's extraordinary that you get Ig. G before IgM, and we've got some data, I'm afraid I can't share it with you because uh, it's been submitted to uh, a journal uh, to suggest that there is huge dysregulation in mononuclear cells that you can detect quite e easily in the blood early on that w you only see in people with respiratory failure. And I believe that it is horrible to toxicus and that there's and the normal smooth transition from innate to acquired is just not happening in some people and we don't so know we, why if, if we take that hypothesis as read um when do you intervene and what would you best intervene with if you had a a, a non-toxic drug that could do what you wanted well i i'd intervene as my mrc grant application which failed wanted to intervene I would intervene very very early 20% of westernized people in in the first you know in the developed world are zinc deficient that's point one um, there's a paper written by Robert Sidwell who essentially discovered oseltamivir where a specific zinc formulation was given to mice given super lethal doses of influenza and essentially only two things significantly reduced their death. One was oseltamivir given for an oseltamivir sensitive strain from day one and the other one was zinc in their water but it was a specific zinc compound. So we're, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving up but the MRC thought uh, this not to be worthy of a prophylaxis trial. I take zinc every day, and I know that a lot of other people do uh, once they've read the zinc literatures. So apart from zinc, um, you haven't mentioned any specific immunomodulatory drugs mm. such as anti-IL-6 uh, and sure. whatever. Are there data to suggest those drugs might be useful? Well, yes. I've, uh, certainly uh, UCLH and Imperial and you know, the people around the world, and of course the Chinese, uh, did a lot of early work on tocilizumab as an anti-IL-6 and anakinra as an anti-IL-1. And uh, do you know what? I think that if it really worked by now, there'd be a New England Journal paper out on it because it's certainly been tried a lot. And some people have said, oh, it's lazarine, you know. And then you say, well, publish, and then they don't. So um, I... It, we may go the same direction as we did with, as we are doing with sepsis and septic shock. One biological response modifier for one cytokine doesn't work in septic shock. And we may be in that same situation. Okay. So to pick you up... Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm not... I, I, I would have... I don't know. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have low-dose steroids or high-dose steroids... And to be quite honest, you know, if I was going to get that sick, uh, I'm not sure I'd have tosmic in. I really don't know. I don't think anybody does. Would you, uh, 
welcome it if you were offered remdesivir? Uh, no. Okay. No, because uh, I've had, if you look at this paper really long and hard, and I, I suggest that, you know, all those interested in this field should do, uh, I do not currently believe that there is really good evidence that this works. Now, it may be that very, very early on, if you reduce the amount of viral turnover in the back of your throat, you might not switch on this cytokine storm or whatever it is. Uh, but I think that by day seven or 10 or 12, uh, it's shutting the barn door after the horse has bolted. And that is my problem with this paper because people cannot, some people are perfectly well, ill have to 28 days. A lot of people on our intensive care units today who get stuck, who are 15, 20 days out, have no recoverable virus from any of their tracheal specimens. And therefore, why should remdesivir work? But they're really sick. And that's why I think there's a switch and then you have to deal with horror autotoxicus because the virus has been gone. It's a personal, you know. So to go back to the, the early slides where you showed uh, the outbreak on the ship with all the, mm. asymp everyone was asymptomatic or most people were asymptomatic. So I don't know if you know because know, you're in the south of France, but the government has today announced track and trace, which is all focused around symptomatic patients. So is it going to work? Uh, I feel like I'm on question time or yes. on Sophie Ridge's program on Saturday morning. Uh, my, my personal belief is that in terms of epidemiology, the reason this virus has got away is that most people who transmit it are young, healthy, and asymptomatic. And yeah. we know from early government uh, suggestions and, and uh, you know, that, that, that in the early days, the triaging was on symptoms. And we now know that probably those who are symptomatic just represent the tip of the infection iceberg. And, okay, I, I and, agree. and for which reason I have always believed that we should test, 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 and test. And the Royal College of Pathologists is about the science. And it's about testing. And I think without that, that any policy that's not test, test again, cannot control this virus because okay. you don't know who's got it and you don't know when they have it, who they're going to give it to. It's that simple. So I, I agree with you that, the, that what we see in hospital is the tip of the iceberg, but I'm puzzled by a number of serial epidemiological studies that find very low rates of antibody prevalence in the population. So what I would hypothesize, but I'd be interested in your thoughts, is that there are many people who are getting infected who are not symptomatic, who are eliminating the virus through their innate immune response and are not making an, adap an adaptive immune response. Is that fair? Well, yes, you know, and, and do you know what? I, I don't think this has been looked at uh, enough. I, I'm responsible for dealing with opportunistic infections in hemato-oncology. Uh, at UCLH, the one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of people with poorly performing transplants can be neuro for months and months and months, but they don't seem to give it to anybody. And if the Holcher data that I showed is correct, there seems to be a same phase of infectiousness that then disappears. And people talk about, oh, well, that's because there's IgA around the spike proteins. That's not been proven either. I do not understand this whole concept of the relationship between finding sequence in people's throats and infectiousness. And I think we're all missing a trick here, but I don't know what it is. And I think that, you know, what would be really welcome is a long, hard look at the relationship between sequence coming out of people's mouths, because RNA is quite labile, and therefore, it must be turning over to produce sequence and, and infectivity. And I don't think it's...
Okay. You're breaking up a bit there. One, one very specific. Sorry. Uh, and I'm just trying to find it. I think it's from someone who has had COVID. Is uh, you you referred to the coagulation problems? Is there any evidence yeah. that, that anticoagulants are useful? Right. So so I'm I'm going to steer a bit clear of that because I am not a hematology clotting doctor. But what I will say is that if you measure people's fibrinogens, and we've done this in a in a, in a cohort uh, of people who actually didn't even end up in hospital. They have massively elevated uh, levels of essentially factors that are procoagulant. And these stay elevated for weeks afterwards. We know there are strokes, and the strokes are worse than they should yeah. be. With so, some of the lung is traumatic. So I've had well, that's, you know, the, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, I've got two, two people um, uh, advocating aspirin. Mm. Um, yes, indeed. Well, well, I, I, I think I, I'd better answer that and, and be quite careful. But I will say that the head of our biomedical research center, Professor Brian Williams, who is, a, uh, who is an expert on these things, is most certainly taking aspirin. <laughs> And of course, 75 milligrams a day is a good idea. But the issue there is, and I'd better watch it because I know very little about this, is, you know, where is the problem? Is it a platelet problem or is it a, uh, a soluble coagulation factor problem? And it may be that what RCPAS should do is actually ask a really professional uh, coagulation uh, uh, this because I have no doubt at all that it plays a huge part in morbidity. That's what the histology is telling us, and that's what the blood tests are telling us. Okay, um, we're going to have to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but if I finish off by going back to zinc, ah. is, is there data that suggests patients may be zinc deficient, and are there differences in the amount of zinc we all drink in our tap water, and whether that's linked to the epidemiology in any way? Well, well, the answer is we don't know. The evidence out there is that on average, one in five people are zinc deficient in terms of measuring their plasma zinc by atomic absorption or what have you. There are papers out there, and I can send a list of those papers, uh, relating to outcome uh, due to pneumonia and septic shock and resume that shows significantly better outcomes in zinc replete people. And uh, my personal belief is that uh, this, is, this would be such an easy thing to do and to look at because the evidence in vitro is now enormous. And now we have clinical evidence in septic shock or pneumonia. I, it, seem, it would seem to be counterintuitive to ignore it. Possibly that's because pharma can't really patent zinc no okay i'll leave it i'll leave it there yeah no well that's an excellent point to leave so so thank you very much indeed that's been extremely interesting uh i can genuinely say i've learned i, I wasn't aware of the zinc story so uh, uh it's been an education um i hope you're able to get back to the uk sooner or later sure <laughs> um but uh thank you and thanks to the audience yeah. thank you for coming and i look forward to seeing many if not all of you next week. Bye for now. Have a great evening everybody. Bye bye. Thanks Vanya.